morning, everyone. Um, I'm Melissa. This is Goldie. Uh, we're going to be talking about lessons learned during the pandemic and onward. Um, let me share my slides and then we'll get started. Okay, so our presentation is called The Seven Wonders of the Great Remote Learning Shift. Um, and we're going to talk about um, just insight and tips that we learned during the pandemic. Um, of course, with this objective, no one size fits all. So certainly customize as you see fit for the places and people around you. Um, we chose the seven wonders as our metaphor because you know, in, in ancient times, wonder meant something very remarkable. And of course the pandemic has been remarkable in so many ways. Um, and remarkable holds that meaning of being you know, good and bad. And that's, that's life, that's been the pandemic. There's been uh, challenges and there's also been silver linings. And um, I do wanna point out the wonders that are included in some of these pictures are the new seven wonders. Um, so that's kind of fascinating that uh, you can visit these places that you see in the pictures as we talk about insights and tips that we discovered during the pandemic. Okay. So with that, we'll just jump right in and we'll start uh, by me sharing with you a history of the Oklahoma Teacher Connection. Uh, OTC, as we call it, was actually uh, brought into existence out of legislation from House Bill 1017 back in 1990. So over 30 years ago, we were not always called OTC. We were once called the Minority Teacher Recruitment Center with a national focus on trying to uh, recruit more males um, and people of color into teacher education. Over the years, as we have evolved, uh, a lot of our activities, our initiatives, our projects um, have, have changed. And, and so we had to go through a period of um, uh, renaming ourselves to encompass everything that we do, uh, hence the Oklahoma Teacher Connection. Our programs involve a, a broad range of participants throughout the state including our K-12 partners and our higher ed partners. And we have programs in our K-12 schools. Uh, we also have programs at the collegiate level, which I'll go into mo more detail here shortly. But in addition to uh, those items, there's also just a, a, a large focus on teacher education in general and uh, what happens in our higher ed institutions as we prepare teachers and uh, subsequently, as they enter the workforce, uh, the, the types of impact that we have on uh, the field of teaching and learning. So in this particular slide, you'll see what our mission is, which is to recruit, retain, and place teachers in Oklahoma schools. And this has always been the mission uh, from the beginning. And we have several uh, programs listed there. Uh, our Teacher Shortage Employment Incentive Program is our program for math and science uh, educators who major in teacher education and after graduation into the workforce and teach at the secondary level in an Oklahoma public school, uh, math or science, whatever their area of expertise uh, entailed. And at the end of their five-year commitment, we share with them uh, an award, uh, which they can uh, put toward their student loans. And if they do not have any student loans, then they are able to uh, keep the award and, and use it at their personal leisure. We also have uh, pre-collegiate programs, which I referred to a, a couple of minutes ago, 
our Lead Oklahoma, our Teach Oklahoma, and our Educators Rising programs. And these are programs that are in our high schools um, to basically uh, garner the interests of young adults uh, in the field of teacher education. And we do recognize that uh, many young adults are not uh, necessarily interested in the field. However, if they do not go into teacher education, they become strong advocates uh, for teacher education. And so we try to start early and capture their interests early by exposing them to the field of education and what all it has to offer, um, that it is a noble profession, that it is meaningful, and that it does change lives. In addition to our pre-collegiate programs, we have our OTC collegiate grants. And these are grants that range uh, in scope. Um, we have grants that entail bringing our lead, teach, and educators, rising students to college campuses to learn about uh, post-secondary education, what it takes to get there, more specifically, uh, what is involved in uh, becoming a teacher and what that major entails. We also have grants in which we work with our emergency and alternatively certified teachers, as well as novice teachers. Um, we just do tons of activities that relate to teacher education, either in the area of recruitment or retention. We also support professional development. We have an annual reading conference, which uh, Melissa is in charge of the reading conference as well as the Teach uh, Oklahoma conference. And so we want to provide strategies and helpful um, information, uh, things that are gonna help uh, our educators or our future educators as they enter the classroom or work with our uh, pre-K uh, students. And then the last component that you see there is teacher education, which is um, broad, uh, that involves work with our educator preparation programs. Um, we uh, uh, deal with policy, we deal with uh, accreditation issues, uh, just a lot of uh, different areas that serve to enhance what our educator preparation programs do, as well as um, improve learning and professional practice of our pre-service teachers and, uh, and what that looks like as they enter the workforce, enter Oklahoma's classrooms and teach our uh, pre-K through 12 learners. And so as you can see here, it, it's basically everything teacher education at the higher ed level um, from uh, pre-K all the way through uh, post-secondary. So one of the things that um, I wanted to talk about was utilizing uh, a quote from a book. Uh, the name of the book is Winners and How They Succeed by Alistair Campbell. Uh, years back, our team started to look at ways to make uh, our programs more engaging. And as always, we want to stay current with information and processes. And so what was the norm? The norm was face-to-face -face gatherings, activities that included hands-on learning with uh, students, K-12 and higher education faculty and teacher faculty. Uh, the curriculum for students and for faculty included emphasis added, paper, workbooks, binders, handouts. Uh, Pre-service teachers conducted their student teaching in person. Uh, clinical practices involved hundreds of school districts in Oklahoma K-12 schools. It was just the way that we did things. So looking forward um, and trying to embrace a vision in which we uh, make ourselves better, become more innovative. We started transitioning to the digital platform and we started looking at the types of things that we did, uh, the curriculum that we 
we utilize the trainings that we held. And similarly in higher education, our colleges of ed, we're looking at ways in which technology could be used to enhance their learning experiences and training their teachers to utilize technology in the classroom. So in looking at this, um, looking at this quote, Alistair Campbell writes that this type of winning mindset is that good teams excel at implementing strategy. You can have all the talent and ambitions you need, but without clear strategy understood by everyone from the top of the organization to the bottom, the ambition would not be fulfilled. And so in moving forward, we had to be willing to explore new opportunities. Within the past 10 years, the technology requirement has uh, even been added to uh, statute and put into policy as a mandatory content area uh, for our teacher education programs. And also we've had to look at ways to put our pre-collegiate uh, program curriculum in a digital format. And we've also experimented with trainings that were virtual instead of face-to-face. -face. Of course, as budget cuts um, happen, then you know travel budgets decrease. It was harder and harder to get into the field. And so it is 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 you can look at it as the half gla the glass half empty or the glass half full. We looked at this as an opportunity to innovate and to do things differently and to, to move into a new uh, era of, of innovation. Okay. So in this particular slide, you have uh, one of our first wonders of the world, which are the pyramids of Giza. It's the largest of the ancient Egyptian pyramids and the oldest of the seven wonders of the world. Made out of granite and limestone, it is a, a structure that is of great engineering, masonry, and technical skill. Can you imagine, can you just imagine what it took to create something so beautiful and so amazing? In my research about the pyramids of Giza, and let me put out a disclaimer that I did not do very well in art history. I just wasn't as engaged then as I am now. Uh, but it took 20 years to complete uh, the pyramids of Giza. And estimates say that around 20,000 to uh, 100,000 workers uh, it took to build uh, this structure. So, you know, I, I kind of reflected upon that and I jokingly said to myself, somebody had to think outside of the box in order to build uh, something uh, so magnificent. So similarly, uh, in 2020, we had to think outside of the box. We had to shift away from the norm. Uh, when COVID hit, I think it was just something that was unreal um, to, to the world. Uh, it, it was a great pause in the earth, if you will. It was just a great pause. Uh, programs, policies, jobs, lives were impacted and lives were changed forever. And so we embark upon um, a new perspective, um, implementing strategy. And in doing so, it would be unique because it would be something um, that we had never had to do before, not, not in this magnitude, this grade of magnitude because of COVID. COVID didn't just impact um, one geographical area or a few geographical areas, it was worldwide. And so I'll shift with that, I'll shift and punt to Melissa. So that brings us to our second point of 
mastering strategy. And let me demystify strategy a little bit because that could be a bit confusing because in the previous quote, we did talk about um, you could have skills and tactics and ambitions. However, if strategy is not understood by everybody on the team, you don't have the vision and the how-to to get there. So to explain a little more fully, strategy is about the how-to or the steps. And so many of us may be big picture people, and that's great because goals are very important. Um, I would say that's a great starting place to have this idea, this goal. But just as important is the execution. And I see this a lot in um, different aspects. You can see it in sports or cooking where you have this great idea and you may have the vision and the buy-in. The buy-in is very valuable. And then the steps to get there may be not as clear or maybe they're not as feasible. And that's why it's very important to find that purpose daily. And that's one of my challenges to you to, to make those many purposeful goals each day and then fulfill those. And an example um, from the book about winning is, you know, if you say, I'd like to lose 20 pounds, well, that's a really big goal. But if you said, I'll do two pounds this week and you cut out some sugar and you lose your two pounds. And then the next week you say, I'll lose two pounds. And so that's why the idea of daily mini goals or weekly goals become very valuable. And we can't lose sight of that purpose every day because in those big overarching goals, we have to find that sense of purpose every day. And I do want to give the caveat of um, not overthinking it. And I'll say many bright people, they realize there's complex layers and there's moving parts. But when we overthink something, that might push us to inaction. And I see that in many gifted students. Um, you know, previously, I taught grad students and some of my um, really sharp students would um, be tough on themselves and know that there's a lot of things going on. And that's the tricky part. When you have awareness of so many pieces of the puzzle, it could push you to not doing um, that daily goal each day. And so the, the point is, we have to have realistic expectations. And that's key to why some people um, become disenchanted or don't have the buy-in because they don't find um, a realistic goal. And that's not to say we can't get to the big goal, but we have to be very careful for the people around us and ourselves to have those realistic expectations. And we see that with the wonders of the world. Obviously, these were not created in one day. Good things take time and they take patience. So um, I guess let's move to our next slide. Okay, so realizing technology is not optional. And I say this with a smile because I, I do love technology. You know, we love our phones. There's a happy part in our brain that just lights up when, you know, you get that little gift of a text message, someone saying, you know, a hello or, you know, an invite to something. So with that being said, technology is a part of our daily lives and we have to be careful about that balance. So yes, we need it to enhance our communication, but we should not use it as a crutch. And remember that with your communications, if we lack that good rapport with colleagues, students, um, whoever is the community that you are working with, um, the technology might actually hinder you. So there, once again, is that careful balance of, you know, an email blast from someone you don't know does not hold as much meaning as a friend who's sending out that group email to help others. Um, yes, I do want to point out, too, that every generation has a different understanding of technology. And this is always fascinating to me because uh, my grandfather was born in 1910, I'm dating myself a little bit if you're doing the math, but um, electricity and working bathrooms were considered really great technology for his generation. And if you think about, um, I'm a millennial, I'm an old millennial, so I'm a millennial senior citizen is the joke, but um, social media is not really technology to me. But what was interesting when I was talking to my nephew, who's a freshman in high school, 
I mentioned the iPhone, which to me is great technology. And he said, that's not technology. And he laughed at me <laughs> because, you know, at 15, he grew up with iPhones and that's just part of his daily life. So consider that you can make anything technology. It's how we use it. Even a pencil could be a form of technology, especially if you're a mathematician or a science person. So um, have that innovation of every generation could consider something as technology and anything could be transformed in an innovative way. You know, putting a new twist on it. It could be something old with a new twist. It could be something new with an old twist. Um, think about all those ways to make it innovative. And so that's why I do want to say technology is not really optional. It's something used to enhance the learning, enhance the community, but also have that careful balance where you do have face-to-face -face interaction. And I do want to follow up and say research shows that that hybrid approach, that mixed approach is the most powerful. So be careful of overloading a particular way because we don't want to overwhelm someone. We don't want to overuse something. So consider how you like to learn um, and I do like to learn with technology and be careful that we tend to favor the way that we love. So um, consider stepping outside your box and using art and music and all different kinds of things, um, which is really fun. I mean, you can teach things very deeply and very profoundly with um, fine arts and, and science and math, you know. And with that, I'm, I'm going to pause myself because I could go on a lot about technology. So I'll piggyback off of uh, Melissa's comments about technology. So pre-COVID, we were doing things the old way, I guess you would say. The norm was paper, binders, worksheets, workbooks, face-to-face. -face. Um, during that time, when we sought out being innovative and uh, becoming more technologically savvy. It was not a requirement. It was just something that we did in the spirit of being innovative and having a vision. So there was this new tool called Zoom. And we decided for fun, we would do a conference and do it half streaming, half face-to-face. -face. And um, this was probably, I don't know when Zoom was created, but it could have been in 2014, 2015, somewhere there. Um, we decided we wanted to move our curriculum online, make it digital so we could get away from the binders. Uh, little did we know that once the pandemic started, that this would be our sole um, tool that we would have to use uh, in order to help maintain our workload, our work duties, uh, as well as communicate to uh, the groups that we uh, deal with on a daily basis and the individuals who have our programs. So this is true that technology should be used to enhance learning uh, in the capacity of the classroom, but it can also be used to maintain essential function. Uh, in some settings, we might be more dependent on it than other settings. Uh, so I appreciate the comments that Melissa made because that is an important um, that's an important assessment to make with the use of technology as it relates to the classroom. Uh, my daughter, you know, when they shut down schools, I became an early childhood teacher. That is not my area of expertise. So I am a fast learner. I had to learn uh, how to use Apple products. I am not an Apple person. I am an Android person. And so uh, I was amazed by the expectations for uh, pre-K students as well as kindergartners. She is a kindergartner. And now her mother knows how to do assignments in Canvas and in Seesaw. And after she completes the assignments, we have to videotape her response uh, and her comprehension of what it was that she learned in that assignment. And then we have to upload those videos. And these are things that kindergartners are doing. And so she had a frustrated mama 
who had to employ the assistance of uh, a college student in the home to help her with those particular uh, uh, assignments. And so, you know, we all have a learning curve as we use this technology. So in slide number six, we see uh, a picture of the Taj Mahal. We're gonna just talk briefly about maintaining partnerships uh, as we enter this new era. The Taj Mahal is another wonder of the world. It is a mausoleum made up of white marble and ivory built in the 1600s. It is located in India. And according to what I have read, it required more than 20,000 workers to build it. So talk about partnerships. Can you even imagine? And all of the individuals who worked on the Taj Mahal to construct this beautiful, magnificent structure were not from the same uh, location. They had to come together, collaborate in order to have a successful outcome. So reflecting on this picture, expectation versus reality. Um, have you ever went on a vacation with the intent uh, to see a certain structure or landmark or visit a certain location and you had an image in your head of what that would be like? It has happened to me numerous times uh, going to Pearl Harbor. You know, I imagined a scene, what I saw in the picture. And when I got there, it was magnificent. It was awing, um, it was humbling, uh, but it was also full of people. <laughs> and so in order to uh, take a photograph or try to capture the moment so that I could remember it forever, you kind of find yourself um, vying for a spot to take the perfect picture and trying to keep you know, other individuals' heads from being in the frame. And so you kind of have this idea of, um, of what, what you have in, pictured in your head and then what the actual reality of a situation or a moment it is. So similarly here in this picture, the Taj Mahal looks, uh, Mahal looks peaceful and serene uh, in one picture, but when one actually experiences it, it is not as majest majestic uh, when you are immersed in, in large crowds and looking at it in reality. So this idea of maintaining partnerships uh, in a similar paradigm is tricky and is challenging. In your head, you like to imagine the ideal partnership, but in reality, they can be difficult. Um, some partnerships might be easier than others but it is always a work in progress, especially in a virtual environment. My solution to partnerships or one way to address successful partnerships is through relationships. You have to have a good working relationship with all key stakeholders in the work that you are doing. We have to take time to build relationships. We need to reflect on what that looks like at a distance and learn how to nurture those interactions so that real presence is felt in a virtual setting despite the distance. So one example of that, which I think is uh, very um, enlightening to me, and we've tried to do it, and many of you have experienced practicing this, um, and I have myself. But I love to see when my daughter in her, um, in her kindergarten class, uh, when school is shut down, they have to do class on their iPad. And the teachers con conduct class as normal. And I took pictures of her, and I really tuned in and I listened as she engaged in her classroom. I didn't think that it was possible uh, due to an experience I had uh, online with a group of fifth graders and trying to teach, teach a class, um, but these teachers did a magnificent job with the class and the students were engaged. They had pen and paper 
They had to do math problems. They had to write answers and they held it up to the camera. Uh, the teacher gave each um, child a chance to speak and to participate and even sent them on, um, on a, a little treasure hunt in the home to grab items and bring it back. Um, they, they did what their usual classroom team uh, is to you know, do the Pledge of Allegiance, to sing songs, um, just all the same activities, just in a virtual setting, and to see how engaged these students uh, were in that process was just simply amazing. So that's the idea that I'm trying to convey is making the presence seem real, even though it's from a distance and it's in a virtual setting. Well, let me talk a little bit about collaboration and resources. And um, fittingly, it comes after partnerships because as Goldie mentioned, those relationships are so valuable and we have to honor people, um, you know, that we have different experiences and um, whether you're a novice or a veteran, you have insight or a new way to look at things and that should be very valuable. Um, with collaboration, um, there's so many different ways you can look at this. I do want to mention one aspect that research has shown is the most influential in so many regards, and that would be mentoring. And that's a tricky thing. Um, sometimes it happens very organically. You click with someone. Um, they've been in a system longer than you. And so you can ask them questions about the history or how things evolved. And um, of course, our veteran teachers and our veteran administrators deserve that respect. You know, they've seen where things came from. They know why it happened. And that is very valuable to growth. And they're modeling that growth mindset because they've been there a while and they know how to keep adapting. Um, you might have seen perhaps on the summer that we have been mentioning adaptive strategies because that is the key to success that you keep um, looking forward honoring and respecting the past, of course, but that you have that, um, that daring spirit to try new things. And guess what? When we try new things, sometimes it doesn't work. And, um, you know, that failure might actually be feedback um, to help you improve that this didn't work out. And so it's nudging you in this direction. So I do want you to think about um, perhaps formal mentoring as a way to collaborate. And then Perhaps less formal would be having those colleagues and those valuable people around you, including students. If you work with students, students have such great insight, especially if they're from different places or younger or older than you. They can bring that very interesting insight because when you know something so well, say you've taught the same course, you know, several years in a row, things become ingrained in you. And so you don't deconstruct it in a way that uh, might have more clarity because you've done it so many times. Sometimes you skip or collaborate or put together steps that need to be broken down a little bit more. Um, I do want to talk a bit on resources with this slide, too. Um, I'm a reader. I get that not everyone's a reader, but... That is some of my advice to try to read daily, try to read daily and reflect daily, because at the end of the day, um, you want to be informed of many perspectives and know where you stand. And that's a valuable skill that I can read articles that I know that's not my stance, but I become more insightful, more well-rounded by um, those encounters with different perspectives. And you know what? You might change your stance on something, and that's okay. That's That can be a good thing to say, oh, I didn't see that before, but now I have deeper understanding of why someone would feel that way or um, promote that idea. Um, with resources, I, I'm going to be inside of reading and just um, immersing yourself in good evidence-based practices. Um, be careful, too, because we know that social media and the internet can post things that are very egregious. They're not accurate. Um, and so you might um, look at that just so you have awareness. What's the rumor going around? I, I don't think you should pay a lot of heed or stress because we know the internet um, 
can just implode with things that may not be accurate, but the truth will come out, you know, eventually um, in this modern day and age, I say the science will show what it really can be or what it really will be um, because we have so many things that will point people in the right direction. Um, Another resource that I find a lot of people like are podcasts. Um, Podcasts and webinars are a way to um, have experts give you such interesting new current research, new current ideas, because it's important to stay current in our field. And professional development is very important. And I'm probably preaching to the choir because we're all here at this um, online summit wanting to learn new ideas and push ourselves. And um, I'll just add one more thing because I know we're starting to run down on time. We want to have a question and answer, but um, try to attend online or in-person conferences. I find myself very inspired by new, new people, new friends, um, as well as our old friends and, and um, our more normal types of things. But that's why I challenge you to keep trying new things, reading new articles. And if you're a practitioner, I do want to mention um, the George Lucas Foundation has some really great research-based articles on edutopia. I know the State Department sometimes will share those. I enjoy them. Um, If you're in higher education, there's so many different resources. Um, The faculty focus is a good one for a lot of um, faculty to write about current happenings in the classroom and also the research to show um, some of the practice and the theory um, together because they inform each other. Let's see, I'm going to keep moving us along. Um, And I'll touch very briefly. Um, You'll notice this is the Great Wall of China. So think about that, you know thousands and thousands of years ago, the innovation it took to keep keep pressing to make this long wall on all these mountains. Um, and that's where I do challenge you to keep taking risks, um, keep seeking out those valuable partnerships, collaborations. And then I'm going to add, have fun with it. You know, um, we can push ourselves and stress, especially I know a lot of high achieving students administrators, employees, they push themselves so much. And the research shows those are the people most likely to have burnout. So remember to take those days off when you need them so you can recharge and come back even stronger. Um, I guess I'll pause myself because I could talk a lot about innovation, but we need to keep moving forward. (laughs) So on this slide, we're uh, uh, talking about adapting to the landscape. And we've kind of given you a a range of of information and topics and areas in which we uh, have to uh, adapt our leadership um, and the workload and the work duties that we have. So this is a picture of Christ the Redeemer. It is located in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil and stands 98 feet tall and the statue's arm spans 92 feet long. It is the largest Art Deco style sculpture in the world. I read that they put in escalators and elevators to better support tourists to get to the top of that monument. And previously before they had the escalators and the elevators, they had to climb 200 steps. So funny story, I went to Heidelberg, Germany and I was just so excited to see the Heidelberg castle. And I think you could pay something like, I don't know, 15 or 20 euros to take the elevator. And uh, I decided, no, I'm going to take the steps. It's 300 feet above the city. So my appeal to you is don't do it. (laughs) Take the elevator, pay, pay pay the cost to take the elevator, the escalators, the path of least resistance. Okay, so this idea of adapting to the landscape, we're kind of toggling back and forth. And so we're in this age where we have this pandemic and we have to go online. We have to take all of our programs online. Our K-12 partners had to adapt all of the curriculum for our high school students to a virtual format overnight. But remember, we were playing with this innovative idea before COVID. So we already had the curriculum in a digital format. We had already transitioned to that. And remember, we had already been playing with this new tool called Zoom when it was first invented. 
Uh, our department, we were the first ones to decide, hey, let's make it fun. You know, let's use this new tool called Zoom and see what it looks like. So we were doing this many years ago. We weren't experts with it. We were just trying to be visionary and innovative. So our EPPs transitioned, uh, our educator preparation programs with what we call colleges of ed. Uh, we had to tr transition to a virtual format. Our state agency had to adapt our practices as well. Well, as you can imagine, all of the policies that are uh, that our K-12 and higher ed partners have to follow, we had to even adapt our policies. And in teacher education, that was really, really tricky because again, we had pre-service teachers who had to do their clinical practice. So now the schools are shut down and this is the graduation requirement to do your clinical practice. Um, so we had to make allowances uh, for temporary placements in alternative settings, um, provide virtual learning opportunities, implement alternative assignments and instruction and augmented instruction and distance learning opportunities. We had to work with our partners uh, in other state agencies that deal with teacher education, our friends at uh, OEQA, the Office of Educational Quality and Accountability had to provide testing waivers and, and voucher options and had to accommodate um, pre-service teachers who had to take their certification exams because testing sites were shutting down. Um, we had to work with our State Department of Education partners because guess what? If the students were not completing their um, graduation requirements as teachers how, and their certification requirements, hey, I need to get a job. I need to be able to teach because this is what I'm going to school to learn to do. So our friends, our partners at the OSDE approved a one-year temporary teaching certificate for the spring completers who were unable to complete their certification requirements due to COVID. So um, partnerships are essential. Relationships are essential. Now, fast forward, we're in this weird period in which we can adapt to either platform, face-to-face -face or virtual. We've learned some lessons with the technology, what works, what doesn't work, how to improve communication, how to improve teaching and learning. We've had to innovate. We've had to learn how far we can stretch ourselves to um, have successful outcomes. We've used all types of technology. You probably can name more than I can. Um, and it continues to evolve. So in adapting to the landscape, I would just suggest that it is an ever moving target. We continue to look forward to innovate, to evolve and to move uh, as necessary so that we can continue to have those successful outcomes. And we included this quote um, from Wayne Gretzky, sort of encapsulate the idea of, I skate to where the puck is going, not where it has been. And that's kind of the mindset that helps you keep thinking, what could improve this? And it's that growth mindset of keep moving forward. It's the idea of continuous improvement that we must embrace strategy and vision. Those things must always be at the forefront. We cannot do it alone. Alone, I reiterate that collaboration, relationships, partnerships are essential and key. We can't do it by ourselves. And we do wanna um, share a little bit about OTC programs. If you are a high school teacher, if you are um, someone looking to improve your school, we offer various programs that are research-based curriculum, mentoring, different benefits. Um, I won't read everything. Our contact information is at the uh, end of these slides. So please, please email and reach out. Cole, did you want to share anything? Uh, the only other thing I wanted to uh, emphasize is uh, there are other initiatives that we engage in, other things that we do to try to support teacher education. We have proposals 
uh, with uh, the um, American Rescue Plan Act funds that have come to the state in order to enhance our teacher education programs at both the collegiate and the pre-collegiate level. We want to continue mentoring. Um, we want to continue supporting initiatives and, and curriculum and strategies that work that um, support those successful outcomes that we see. Uh, we also have put in a, a budget request uh, for our agency in the area of teacher education so that we can continue supporting more programs in addition to what we already have. And we are also trying to increase uh, the pipeline of teachers because, you know, everybody has to have a teacher. They have to learn. Teachers influence all careers, all professions. Teachers change lives. And we have to have teachers to do those types of things. And so some takeaways that we want to share is about remembering to reflect about your work and the vision of where it's going and keep that in mind each day on a daily level. And then, of course, have that big picture view as well. Um, keep discovering things. Discovering is key to learning, having that excitement, having that sense of wonder. Um, do you want to share a little bit about adapting? And evolving? Well, I will say that like the seven wonders of the world. We have to continue to work collaboratively and creatively embracing change and moving forward on every changing landscape. So the question here is what is the future of teacher education? Because that encompasses the work that we do and my response to that question is that the possibilities are endless. And you can drop in the chat too ideas and um, looking forward about you know what teachers can do, uh, different ideas about what the future could look like. We appreciate uh, all of your time today and for sitting in on our presentation. And uh, feel free at this time to unmute. We, you know, welcome uh, questions and comments and interaction. Uh, again, we really appreciate you being here today. And let me pull up our contact information as well. And um, I also put the website on there. There's something in the chat. Oh, let's pull up the chat. We have three different screens in here. So you see our heads shifting in like different places. We see you better on the screen, <laughs> but I realize when we're talking to you, we're supposed to look in the camera. So it's a little weird, but our PowerPoint is here and there. So, And I noticed there was a comment. I think this comment was earlier on, but we had our slides going about the actual implementation and execution. Um, that is such a profound comment because um, you know, if you have different administrators or different people come in, sometimes you all of a sudden shift and you haven't fully implemented something and it didn't get a, a real chance. So that's why I always say it takes a little bit of time. Now it's been, you know, um, a while and something's not working. Don't be afraid to stop it because there are parameters. You know, there are those boundaries of it's been three years and nothing's changed and we need to do something different. So that's why I do say take risk. Sometimes they don't work out, but that's, um, that's the mindset of winners, you know, that you're willing to not always win, but you don't like losing. So you're going to get better. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I agree with that. Brad said, agree, there can be value in fast failure. And I think that is something that we have to learn and develop over time is that, there is no success without failure. It's, it's not. And there are times where, you know, we, we do engage in initiatives and activities. And if it doesn't go so well, or even sometimes we deal with the legislature and if it's policies or statutes that are passed and we know that it's not good for, for students, um, it gets frustrating and we tend to feel deflated um, and, uh, but that does not 
uh, that should not cause us to give up. We must always press forward. We must always try because in the end, you have to remember why are you doing what you are doing? What is the reason that you are in place? You are of value and you have contributions to make not only to your colleagues and your peers, to, in our case, teachers and students, but also to the people of this great state. We serve our state proudly and we want to do good work and we want to make sure that we are innovative and that we are always operating on a continuous improvement model. Uh, no pun intended that that's a term that we use in our educator preparation programs, but we always want to do better. We want to be better and do better. And I've still got the chat box up. Um, yes, you know, educators go into the field very optimistic and go into the field wanting to be innovative and change students' lives. So when we have that, um, that realization that people go into their fields very passionate, um, it would be unfair to judge people in haste. Um, so that's a great comment. I believe Thomas just wrote down. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So we're at 10.52. Any final thoughts? I just want to say I really appreciate the presentation, Goldie and <clears throat> Melissa, and I completely agree with everything that you said about innovation in particular. It's not a linear process, and it's often iterative, and I think my favorite word to use is pilot. <laughs> you know, if you're doing a pilot, there's room for lessons to be learned, and you just build that in from the front. Uh, so, so I think that we really share the same philosophy on that. I wanted to I wanted to say hi real quick. Melissa, it's been a while. Langston misses you. Um, hello. Hello. But I also really loved what you all were saying about setting um, goals in more manageable chunks. I think that's so important, not just for students, but also for educators, because we look at big, broad pictures, but actually we need to chunk things for ourselves as well. I just thought it was so uplifting to be listening to you. It was so nice. I can't wait to find this recording and listen to it again because it's just so uplifting. So thank you. Good to see you, Allie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa, you all are welcome to end the session whenever you're ready. And thank you again very much for presenting today. Good to see you all. Thank you. And I will leave you with the parting words that I always left my students when I was teaching Go forth and do good. There we go. Bye-bye.